So I'll just quickly recap what we have been discussing, right? So we have been talking about graphical models, both directed and undirected. And we're driven by this primary goal that we are interested in joint distributions of a large number of random variables. And we're just considering the discrete case. And even in the discrete case, we see that this is intractable because you end up with uh, exponential number of parameters in your distribution, and it's impossible to specify those. So the basic idea that we have been uh, uh, going towards is that given this large distribution, how do you factorize into uh, small factors which we can deal with? And as you factorize a graph, as you factorize a distribution properly, what will happen is the number of parameters that you need to learn to fully specify the distribution is going to decrease. Yeah, yeah. so you wanted to factorize it, and this factorization essentially reduces the number of uh, uh, parameters that we have in the joint distribution. And that's what our goal has been. And then we saw that a graph is a good way of representing this. And the nodes in the graph essentially are associated, or with each node in the graph, we have an association, associated conditional probability distribution in the directed case. And these conditional probability distributions are the factors in our graph. Right? And we also saw for some toy examples how the number of parameters drastically decreases for these conditional parameters, uh, conditional uh, probability distributions as compared to specifying the full joint distribution. And not only that, it's also more compact, it's more modular. Uh, if you want to add new variables, it becomes easier. And it's also more tractable f computationally, less storage. Statistically, lesser amount of data required because you have to learn lesser number of parameters. And cognitively, if you were to ask a human to give you uh, values for some of these tables, okay, you at least tell me what is the probability of uh, salinity given pressure. That is something an expert could probably tell you. He just has to give you these four values, and that's easier, more tractable as asking him or her to specify the full joint distribution. Right? So that's what our goal is. We are always interested in reducing the number of parameters so that our learning eventually becomes easier. So far for all our discussion, we have assumed that someone is going to give us these factors, but eventually we'll head to a state where we'll try to learn these factors, okay? And uh, from the directed case, we moved on to the undirected case because we came up with a very simple example and where we saw that having directions does not make sense because there is no hierarchy in some cases and it's like both the factors or both the random variables that you're considering interact with each other rather than depend with e depend on each other, right? I mean, they do depend on each other, but the dependence is symmetric in some sense. Right? It's like an interaction, both are equal contributors and that's what happened in the study group example. And from there, we came up to undirected graphical models and where we argued that the factors in the undirected graphical models should uh, correspond to these maximal cliques, okay? And that was not sacrosanct. You could also have cliques instead of maximal cliques, but it's just that maximal cliques again gives you a minimum possible set of parameters and it captures what you actually want to capture. You want to capture the interactions between all elements of the study group. So why not use just one clique to represent that study group, okay? So that was the factorization. So on the left hand side, you see the factorization for the Bayesian network, which was factors were conditional probability distribution. On the right hand side, you also see a factorization with the difference that the factors here are not probability distribution. They are just known as clique potentials. These need not take values between 0 to 1. These could be arbitrary things, and we actually saw some examples of these arbitrary uh, clique values, uh, sorry, uh, factor values. Uh, I'll just probably go to that quickly if it's nearby. It's not nearby. Huh. Not nearby. Yeah, something like this, right? So it looks, the table actually looks very much similar to a probability distribution, except that it's not a probability distribution, it's just some values which capture the affinity between different value, different possible assignments of the random variables, right? So 0, 0 is more likely as compared to 1, 1 or 0, 1 or 1, 0, right? That's what this table essentially captures, right? And again, I repeat, so far we have assumed that someone has given us these tables and we are talking about things that once these tables are given, what are the kinds of reasoning that we could do? So we saw some reasonings like uh, causal reasoning, evidential reasoning, explaining away and so on, right? And the case of the directed graphical model. Right? And coming back to the undirected case, even though these factors are not probability distributions, we are not too worried about it that because we know that given any kind of real numbered values, we can always do this normalization so that the resulting quantity ends up being a probability distribution such that the values lie between 0 to 1, right? And that actually is one concern that we will have to deal with going forward 
that this partitioning function or the value z which makes sure that these factors eventually give us a probability distribution that is intractable because it has to sum over all possible values of all the random variables right that is what z tells us it is over the entire uh, universal set it gives you the assignments to all possibilities in the universal set and that is the same as just a fancy way of saying what we already know right we always divided by all possible outcomes in the set that is what probability tells us right your interest events of interest divided by all possible events in the set and that is what z actually does and those number of outcomes are very very large they are exponential actually right because we need to consider all possible assignments to all these values which even in the binary case is 2 raised to n ok. So, this z is going to be a problem going forward and at some point we will have to deal with that ok. So, that is the summary of what we did before the summer vacation and uh, now we will uh, continue from that point and we are again interested in this question of what are the independencies encoded by a Markov network. So, let u be a set of all the random variables in our joint distribution right. So, x 1 to x n is that set u and now let x y z there is some overloading of variables now these x is different from the x 1 to x n that we have been considering so far. Let x y z be some distinct subsets of u right. So, say the first k random variables is x the next k random variables is y and the remaining random variables are and some distinct subsets right it does not matter in what order you have taken or whatever ok. Now, a distribution p over these random variables would imply that x is independent of y given z if and only if we can write the joint distribution as a product of the following factors. So, what is so unique about these factors? x and y do not appear in the same factor right and they do not appear in the same factor that means they are not connected they are not part of any clique right. And x and z and y and z can appear in the same factor that is fine. So, given z x is independent of y that is what this means. So, if that condition if the distribution can be factorized like this then it means that x is independent of y given z right. This is again defining the semantics of a Markov network just as we had defined the semantics of a Bayesian network ok. Uh, so, let us see this in the context of our original example right I mean here this does not hold right what was the independence in this uh, example do you remember the independences A is independent of C given B comma D and B is independent of D given A comma C. So, based on the discussion that we just had this joint distribution should have factorized in a particular way is it factorizing in that way. So, I told you a uh, uh, rule for when is x independent of y given z and remember then x y and z are sets of random variables they need not be individual random variables right. So, according to that rule what should the factors have been actually what is x in the first case what is y and what is z b comma d. So, what kind of factors should we actually had have phi of x comma z and phi of c comma z right or other y comma z. So, this is x this is z this is y this is z do we have factors of that form. If you were allowed to be a bit creative do we have factors of that form right we just need to rearrange these terms right I mean this let us see we can write it as these two terms together is a larger factor depending on b comma a comma c and these two terms together is a larger factor depending on d comma a comma c right. So, now this is x oops this is x this is z this is y this is z. So, we have the condition that x is independent of phi given z right. It is just a matter of rearranging these factors and nothing changes right you still can have the modular factors where you have a phi 1 and phi 2 which operate only on a b and b c. It is just that using that you can always compute phi phi not a good choice but ok. Is that fine does that make sense ok. So, that is the rule for Markov networks. And it is also you could again do a different kind of rearrangement uh, 
to get the other uh, independence which was A independent of C given B D. Just need to arrange the factors a bit differently. Okay? So, if you could factorize the joint distribution as factors of the form phi x z phi y z then x is independent of y given z. Okay? Now, the next thing that we are going to decide define just as we had defined for a, a Bayesian network we had defined parents of a node. In the case of a Markov network we are going to define something known as a Markov blanket which is nothing but the collection of all the neighbors of x. Right? So, for any given Markov network for a given random variable x belonging to this network we can define the Markov blanket of this x as all the neighbors of x in h right? and this is illustrated in the diagram. Right? Now, what to consider as a neighbor is again something up to you. So, can I consider these two be to be neighbors? If I want I can, right? it is again a modeling choice which I make. So, if I, if, I to, if I were talking about these things as pixels in an image I would probably decide to choose all of these as neighbors. Right? Uh, but if it is some other application maybe where these diagonal neighbors do not make sense. So, I will just connect the horizontal and vertical neighbors. Right? So, that is completely up to me. But once I define these neighbors then this is known as the Markov blanket of x. So, now just as for the Bayesian networks we had this rule that a node is independent of all non descendants given the parents and now I have given you some kind of an equivalence between parents and a Markov blanket. Can you tell me a rule for Markov networks? Is the analogy clear? How many of you get what I said just now? Please raise your hands. Yes, sorry, you had a question. No, you'll have to draw an edge. Right? So what I said is that I just started this discussion by saying that just as you had parents in the case of Bayesian networks. In the case of Markov networks I am defining this Markov blanket right, which is essentially everything that covers a given node. Right? And in the case of Bayesian networks you had this rule that given the parents the node is independent of all its non descendants. Right? Remember in the case of Markov networks non descendants does not make sense because there is no concept of descendants at all. Okay? So, again given in Bayesian networks you had this rule that given the parents the node is independent of all its non descendants. The parents analogy in the case of Markov networks is the Markov blanket. So, now can you give me a rule for the Markov networks? Given the Markov blanket node is independent of all other nodes, right? Okay? The, that makes intuitive sense, right? So, given so x is independent of everything from the universal set except of course x itself and the Markov blanket given the Markov blanket. Does that make sense? Okay, and this you should see an analogy of this with the rule that we had for the Bayesian networks. Okay. So, this is what we had for the Bayesian network these were the local independencies again okay, we have fixed this local independences in the Bayesian network and these are the local independencies in the Markov network this is already fixed you do not need to know this. Okay. Is that fine? So, parents, neighbors, non descendants, non neighbors. Is that fine? Okay, so that's the rule for Markov network. So this is, uh, I mean, as I was uh, uh, explaining to someone, right? So uh, we are in the course of deep learning. For deep learning, we need some, we need to cover some topic known as RBMs. For RBMs, we needed this entire background of graphical models, which is a separate course in itself. What I've tried to do is, whatever is the minimalistic path that I need to take through this jungle, I've taken and from here we will eventually try to reach RBMs. So, what I am trying to impress upon you is that graphical models even if you read one chapter from the book it is perhaps much much more than what I have covered as background of directed models or directed graphical models undirected graphical models and so on right. But my intention is not to do a course on graphical models I have just done the minimalistic concepts that we need to eventually reach RBMs and from there reach variational auto encoders and per perhaps auto regressive models right. So, that is what we are aiming for and some minimalistic path I have taken already and we will continue probably exploring some more short paths in this jungle and then eventually get to RBMs hopefully by tomorrow or day after tomorrow. Okay? So, with that I uh, will just go to the next lecture.